Hey everyone, you are listening to the Empire and Deep State series. This is based on the book, American Exception, Empire and the Deep State by the political scientist and historian, Aaron Good. I'm Ben Norton and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Aaron Good and Seamus McGinnis. And we're talking about the history of the US empire and deep state going through chronologically. Recently, we discussed the history of the Eisenhower administration and U.S. coups in Iran and Guatemala, and the the early foundations of the war in Vietnam, and covert operations in Indonesia and Cuba. So a lot of history there. We're now moving on to the next president, John F. Kennedy. And of course, this is a huge topic. There are hundreds of books written about JFK and the assassination and the cover-up and all of that. And a, a large part of this book, American Exception, Empire and the Deep State by Aaron Good focuses on the importance of JFK and his administration. This, this moment where it looked like there might potentially be a potential halt to the Cold War, a potential withdrawal from Vietnam. And of course, after the assassination, it was just all full going forward with more war, with the escalation of the Cold War. So this, this period is extremely important to understand in the history of the U.S. empire and deep state. Aaron, you actually yourself appeared in the new documentary that Oliver Stone made about the JFK assassination. And you've done a lot of research on this. And it's, it's in your book, American Exception. Let's just start at the beginning of the JFK administration. This, this episode is just going to be part one of a several part series on the history of the JFK administration. So talk about why JFK was such an important president in U.S. history, despite the fact that he was only in power for around 1,000 days. Right. Well, I am not of the baby boomer generation. I have no memory of JFK or nostalgia for the 1960s because I was born after the 1960s. Uh, that said, I still think that JFK's presidency is one of the best uh, you know, small portions that you could look at of U.S. history to really get an understanding of the U.S. empire and the American state, the American deep state. I would argue that in his own way, he tried to carry on the legacy of Henry Wallace. He wanted to end the Cold War uh, and pursue an internationalist policy that sought to address problems in U.S. society as well as in the rest of the world. He supported third world nationalism, and this goes uh, back even further, as we'll discuss in a little bit. It goes back beyond when he was a, the president. It goes back to his time in Congress. He also supported uh, socialist politicians in places like Italy. You know, he was more friendly to the like compromise idea that Aldo Moro had uh, and tried to pursue that as president. Um, so he had a different take than the sort of Atchison and Dulles consensus on that issue. But the problem, what makes JFK sort of confounding and the reason why uh, there are still people who argue in really harsh anti-JFK terms uh, is that he also had to serve as president of an out of control, lawless imperial project that denied the fact that it was imperialist in the first place. The myths of the Cold War and the secrecy of covert action meant that the public and the political class all accepted ridiculous ideas as facts. Uh, the, this crackpot realism is what Mills called this, this sort of common sense that prevailed in these among the elites in the U.S. And it meant that nobody, no politician could really speak honestly about U.S. foreign policy, even if they could somehow arrive at a decent understanding uh, in the face of all the propaganda and the myths that, um, that, that prevail in the U.S., about US foreign policy. So JFK is really a guy who ends up confronting the deep state and confronting the establishment in ways that he did not understand when he took office. And he seemed to get it more as events unfolded. But, you know, it, he ultimately, you have to look at JFK as a guy who failed in doing what he sought to do uh, because he miscalculated and he got assassinated. And that was not part of the plan. So we can learn from his successes in terms of who prevented nuclear apocalypse, for example, and the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, but also how he failed. He he was not able to stop a terrible war in Vietnam or the atrocities in Indonesia afterwards or many other things. He wasn't able to end the Cold War, wasn't able to end the nuclear 
sort of Damocles hanging over humanity, which is another thing he wanted to do. So we can learn a lot from learning about how he, he tried to do certain things and failed. And then this can tell us something about the system. So he might be a hero to liberals and he may represent, uh, you know, post New Deal era, the like pinnacle of like liberal statesmanship in the United States. But he also, because of what happened to him, he is uh, a guy whose story essentially discredits a lot of liberalism and not uh, the ideas that uh, liberal Democrats put forward today. The, the system is actually much more sinister than than they are than they are assuming when they argue for like voting Democrat and and such. So if you want to go back to Kennedy, go back and look at his father, uh, Joseph Kennedy, and this is important to understand where he comes from. So I have a little bit I'm going to say here. I'm not going to go into great detail about it. But Joseph Kennedy Sr. is the patriarch of the Kennedy family. He's an Irish Catholic guy, born in 1888, and he lived to 1969, which means that he outlived three of his sons. Joseph Jr., who died in World War II. Of course, Jack Kennedy in 1963 gets assassinated. And John Kennedy, John Kennedy's brother, Robert Kennedy, gets assassinated in 1968. So John uh, Joseph Kennedy Sr. became very rich as a businessman and investment banker. Uh, he made a lot of money in film distribution also and insider trading. So he had like a not a necessarily a monopoly, but he controlled a lot of the film distribution in the United States, made a lot of money that way in the roaring 20s and also made a lot of money in the stock market. Um, there's a picture. There's a picture that I found of him with two of his sons who died too young, Joseph Jr. Uh, and Jack Kennedy. So it's this, by the way, it's like I'll put this all in a PDF that I'll go with this episode. But it's this is Joe Kennedy had the idea of instilling in his kids a sense of noblesse oblige. Okay, he is only in the late '60s it emerged that he was like had made his fortune in bootlegging. Uh, but the a guy who wrote a biography on him says that he never really could find any good substantiation on this. So I tend to think that that is uh, something of a, you know, one of those post Kennedy assassination sort of things. Like it's the posthumous assassination of the Kennedy cl clan and so on uh, after the fact that the because the media puts out a lot of anti Kennedy stuff. It's hard to to suss all this out. But he did make a lot of money in shady ways, especially with. Uh, insider trading and market manipulation and other things like that. And he was so good at this, uh, in fact, that he became a part of the New Deal and he was the chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. So he was, it's like to catch a thief or whatever, you hire a thief to, you know, understand how to protect your, yourself. This was sort of him with the SEC. He was called a class trader for this. Uh, on, for, for, among other things, he wasn't a wasp. And so a lot of these Wall Street types were very waspy and they didn't like this sort of upstart guy. And he was also cracking down on their, you know, money for nothing schemes on the stock market. He also was ambassador to Britain. And at one point, he's infamous for supporting appeasement. Uh, it doesn't seem that he supported it necessarily because he was a right wing Tory aligned person. Uh, I think that it may have had to do with his perception of the weakness of the of uh, the British in terms of being able to even stand up to Hitler. But regardless, this caused him problems with the Roosevelt administration when the Roosevelt administration moved more against Hitler. He was more of an isolationist or he didn't want the Americans to get involved in a losing cause there. So was how how connected was he to the mob? All as, Like I said, this is sort of dubiously sourced. Uh, a lot of this is exaggerated. And when you when you get down to it, it doesn't seem like the sources are so rock solid on this. That said, I would have to imagine that with the deep political economy of the United States, it's very unlikely that any kind of upstart person like himself would have had no contact with you know, entities like the the Teamsters and other organized crime and political bosses and so on. It just seems to be part of the U.S. character. But I don't think that he was as mobbed up as they try to say that he was. But who knows? The mob, I see the mob as being really intertwined in American society. So it would be shocking to me if there was, you know, no um, connection between any of his business dealings and organized crime. I don't, I think that like any other businessman, you had to work with these elements. So as far as JFK goes, he did grow up very wealthy, uh, extremely wealthy, although not as wealthy as like the Rockefellers. OK, he says this at one point. Somebody tried to ask about how much money they had. And he said, yeah, well, you know, the Rockefellers, that's that's really not a lot of money. That's what we're really talking about. If we're talking about a lot of money. Not like he wanted to have that much money, but he was just saying like, OK, our family is, is rich, but there's a whole other level of like rich people. But he was able to go to great schools. 
He went to Choate, which is a, a New England uh, elite private school. Then he went to Princeton and Harvard. Uh, he went into the military, uh, fought in World War II. That PT-109 story, he was something of a war hero. He may have badly piloted his ship and got it destroyed by a, a Japanese destroyer, but then he swam all night with his uh, crewmate's life jacket in his teeth, saved this guy's life, and then ends up on the Marshall Islands somewhere and is able to survive. Comes back and with a you know a, a good uh, hatred of war because of this, because he's seen it firsthand. Uh, he marries Jacqueline Bouvier, who is uh, American of French extraction, like families from France, uh, Jacqueline Bouvier. And uh, she's actually, they, they actually hail from this town called, I think, Pont Saint-Esprit in France, which coincidentally, totally coincidental, this, this, I mean, really coincidental, I'm not being a wise guy, was uh, a place that the CIA <clears throat> dosed with acid. They dosed everybody with acid and a few people died, uh, killed themselves in different ways because of this. So but she's French from a you know, well, well-to-do family, marries Jack Kennedy. Uh, and then he becomes a congressman and then eventually president of the United States with a narrow win uh, over Nixon. And so he goes all the way from war hero, rich kid to war hero, to congressman, to senator, to president of the United States. So if we, you brought up C. Wright Mills and the idea of uh, crackpot realists, which as we've talked about before, uh, runs along the lines of uh, a quote that um, these people have sold a believing world on themselves and they had, hence the irony, to play the chief fanatics in their own delusional world. And that is very characteristic of the foreign policy consensus. We were talking off mic before this about how bipartisanship breaking down and uh, and essentially the allegiances of empire being uh, instrumentalized on behalf of the different parties um, in our domestic political system has undermined the empire and, and made it um, exceedingly difficult to upkeep uh, in recent years. But of course, the Cold War was a time when that really wasn't even on the table. And to whatever extent domestic politics played a role, like in the Kennedy versus Nixon race, it was really just a race to one up each other on who could be more fanatically anti-communist. So, you know, as we're looking at that bipartisan consensus of crackpot realism in the American foreign policy establishment, why were both of our domestic political parties so committed to the Cold War in the 15 years leading up to the Kennedy assassination, or sorry, the Kennedy administration? Well, we have two guys here who kind of epitomize the problem with the Democratic side of the foreign policy establishment. One of the first is kind of arch villain of this era, uh, Dean Acheson, who I would say probably outranks Alan Dulles in terms of like being like Mr. Deep State, I'll, except unlike Dulles, he's not just the technician of like, you know, murder and, and subterfuge. He's actually like deciding the, the bigger goals of this. And um, he was the, the Democratic Advisory Council on Foreign Policy in the 1950s. Um, was dominated by Dean Acheson and his compatriot, Paul Nitze. Dean Acheson was also the boss of the guy who created containment in the early days of the Cold War, George Kennan. Uh, and Paul Nitze is the guy who drafted in SC-68, which called for massive American uh, rearmament in 1950, created the military-industrial complex. And around the same time that this was happening, that you had in SC-68 and the push for war uh, in, in Korea to revive the military-industrial complex and or to create it, really, to solve the dollar gap problem in Europe and also in East Asia, and also to perhaps take the heat off of Taiwan because without a Korean war, perhaps China is able to take, to actually take the island of Taiwan. So this would have some serious consequences, right? So they, they draft this NSC 68, which is kept secret, but it's known that it's like something Truman wants to pursue and the administration wants to pursue massive rearmament. And they also create this, as an uh, you know the military industrial complex itself like corporate entities people who are connected to politics and corporate america uh create this thing called the committee on the present danger and they're there to promote the fear of communism uh and sort of cap with paranoia about it and promote massive military spending as a way to confront this supposedly existential threat of communism which was mostly made up uh, it was mostly done for economic reasons and for imperial re reasons you can say that for the whole cold war i i am of the mind that the whole cold war was basically a top-down production uh the U the soviets didn't want it but the u.s empire needed it 
And uh, it's so it has great parallels to today in the war in Ukraine. But this group, the Committee on the Present Danger, they form and they're there to promote, uh, you know, publicity for NSC 68, massive anti-communist propaganda and so on. They then sort of dissolve, kind of like the Project for New American Century is, uh, uh, dissolves, you know, not that long after 9-11. They dissolve not that long after the Korean War. And they reform in the 1980s. And this time, Paul Niss is actually a member of it. Um, he, I don't think he was on the original um, committee, but then he is. And I think there's another one today called the Committee on the, the Committee on the Present Danger for of China or something like a China version of it. So they just, just guys keep rolling this stuff out all the time. But the point is, this is the Democratic side, and Dean Acheson, very Wall Street super establishment guy, uh, he was. Pro, you know, probably had a big role in creating most of the U.S. national security state in the early parts of the Cold War, you know, containment and all that. Later, the more right wing version of like rollback and NSC 68. And that's on the Democratic side. That's who that's who that would have been people that Kennedy would have been familiar with. The other Republican side is even worse. And that's the Dulles brothers. We've already talked about a good bit, but they are, um, you know, they are. Sullivan and Cromwell to the bone. So these guys are very have a very similar mindset. You can talk about Atchison Dulles consensus on foreign policy, and the, Atchison. If you, there's a great interview with him with Dean Atchison at, at the Truman Library uh, website, and he's talking about uh, bi bipartisanship. He says it's like a fraud more than let more or less, even though he knows it's a bipartisan foreign policy. But what he really means is like a lot of this is top down. He says bipartisanship is a fraud, but it's a necessary fraud. He goes, it's a great myth that ought to be fostered. Don't bring too much damn scholarship to bear on it. You'll prove it out of existence if you're not careful. OK, what he means is it's really nonpartisan taken out of the purview of politics uh, in Congress. OK, he also said, you start with the premise that democracy is some good. I don't think it's worth a damn. I think Churchill is right. The only thing to be said for democracy is that there's nothing else that's any better. And therefore, he used to say, tyranny tempered by assassination, but lots of assassination. Um, so this is a guy who really didn't have much, he had didn't have much belief really in democracy at all. And here he is casually sort of talking about assassinations and approvingly quoting Churchill. Um, later on, this is notable, I think, uh, when after the Kennedy assassination and right after Oswald gets murdered in police custody, people like Joseph Alsop and um, D uh, Rostow, Eugene Rostow, were lobbying LBJ and LBJ's aides. And they kept name dropping Atchison as the person who was really behind this. And this was to create the Warren Commission. So if you want to talk about getting a little bit ahead of the game here, you're some of the suspects for the Kennedy assassination that were like actually connected to government government insiders would would be, if I had to guess, Dean Acheson and Alan Dulles uh, in particular. So it's a bipartisan, it's a foreign policy consensus. Uh, and that's what Kennedy was going up against. Okay. So uh, this, th this is what Kennedy was facing. He was facing this uh, monster of an imperial behemoth and he was trying to, to slowly separate from it in different ways. Yeah. So talk more about that. I mean, Aaron, you, you laid out two individuals who every every American in particular, but in general, people around the world should know. Dean Acheson and Alan Dulles, two deep statesmen, if you will, right? Two godfathers of the U.S. deep state and the U.S. empire. And they established this kind of imperialist consensus that eventually became bipartisan. But this, this is still the early days of this imperialist consensus. So how did JFK respond to it? What, what were his thoughts on, you know, this Atchison Dulles consensus? Well, he didn't confront it head on. He most he typically agreed with the prevailing. He's, you know, he's described as a Cold Warrior, and it's not totally unfair to call him that because he did uphold the major tenets of the Cold War. He didn't say the Cold War is just imperialism uh, and it really we're just a sort of a capitalist project directed in a top-down way you couldn't say you wouldn't say that i don't it's hard to say that he even thought about it as that straightforward although by the end you really do wonder how, how well he understood what the neo-colonialism was really all about so the cold war is let's just be honest here it's a cover for empire like i like i said and like we've been saying containment though framing it as containment allows the u.s to define 
this imperialism as defensive. So by terming it as the Cold War, not the U.S. quest for global dominance, you're able to say this isn't imperialism. This is just we're trying to contain this really bad thing called communism. And we want to decolonize the world, but we got to make sure that we're not allowing the communism in because it may be tempting to these countries to have easy answers and shortcuts of communism, but we don't want that. Okay, this is like the common sense of the of the U.S. This is the crackpot realism, and you can't really break with that consensus. Okay, that said, JFK seems to have had some anti-imperialist inclinations by virtue of being an Irish Catholic, uh, and he, he could not be unaware of what British imperialism had done to his own you know, ancestors, forcing them to come to the United States also. Um, and Atchison and Dulles were very much Anglophiles and they admired the Brits, uh, even though they were they did pursue a hostile takeover of the British Empire. They were people who were more in the Brit in the mold of British imperialism. As far as JFK's political career goes, his he had a relationship to a diplomat, State Department employee named Edmund Gullion, and some people see this as a really important influence on JFK's thinking. It's a historian named Richard Mahoney, who lays a lot of this out in his book, JFK, Ordeal in Africa. Uh, JFK and Gullion first met in the 40s when, of all people, it was Dean Acheson who sent Edmund Gullion, who was a part of the State Department, and, and Acheson would have been running the State Department, uh, to help JFK on this foreign policy speech. Then later, JFK and RFK go for a seven-week trip through parts of Asia in 1951, uh, and they met Edmund Gullion in Saigon. According to RFK, this had a big, uh, a very, very major impact on JFK's thinking. There's uh, some home video footage of this trip that you can find on the internet, including a grainy picture uh, at one point of um, Robert Kennedy standing in front of a civil, civil air transport plane, which would later go on to become Air America, a notorious heroin trafficking airline. But I think that's just more of a historical footnote there and kind of a funny one that uh, they flew on Air America planes, but they were all over Southeast Asia. So it kind of makes sense. Um, I don't think they were there for heroin. There's also a great picture of them walking uh, under in French Indochina with this group. And you can spot JFK uh, in the background, which is like you do, he's very far in the back. But then when you see him, you, you notice it. So we'll include that picture, too. Um, but Edmund Gullion on this trip described the French uh, position as being totally hopeless. And Kennedy saw things that were very alarming to him, like restaurants where people that were sitting outside on like balconies would have a, a net over the top of them. And JFK asked why that was and was told it's for grenades so that if they like throw grenades, they're less likely to like land in, among the people and kill them. So it was really not a good situation and it was hopeless. And that's what he was told by Gullion. So what did Kennedy do after that meeting with Golian and, and sort of realizing the reality of the situation in what would become Vietnam? Well, upon JFK's return from uh, Asia, from his Asia trip, he went on ra the radio and he categorically dismissed the survival prospects of the French Empire and into China. It's in 1951 and he's saying... It's a serious mistake for the U.S. to ally itself with, quote, the desperate effort of a French regime to hang on to the remnants of empire uh, without demanding any political reform, i.e. independence. So uh, this was the only way to defeat communism, JFK thought, not through sheer military force. So he thought what the French needed to do was say, we're going to win this war against communism, but the idea is to for us to get out of here and give you independence, okay? Um so this is already he's saying that they don't want to be stuck in this war trying to fight, you know, a, a war where they're hated by the population and so on. And the, and the U.S. was paying for the entire French war effort at this point. So he's really criticizing a U.S. foreign policy, especially under Eisenhower. This would ramp up even more. Uh, he continued to consult with Gullion after his victory in the Senate in 1952. Um, in 1953, he gave a speech about the hopelessness of the French case, and he also tried to add a an amendment. He's, he said that the insurgency uh, couldn't be put down unless France guaranteed complete independence after the war. And um, in practice, okay, this could have been interpreted as support for an anti-communist war, which is fair enough. But in practice, he likely would have persuaded Vietnam to accept a neutral resolution, just as he later did as president in Laos. That also happens to be exactly what RFK told Dan Ellsberg face-to-face -face in 1967. 
that they would have done in Vietnam rather than going for a full on war like LBJ. Okay. Kennedy did understand more than other people in politics in the US at this time that the nationalist aspirations of the third world could not be defeated. So he introduces this amendment to uh, a bill to make US aid to France contingent upon agreeing to independence afterwards. And this amendment was soundly defeated in the Senate. But, but Kennedy was actually saying something closer to the truth and he took an unpopular stand and at least and got defeated, but at least it was something. Uh, in 1954, he gives a speech at the Cathedral Club, recognizing that the Viet Minh are nationalists and that Ho was really popular across society owing to years of fighting the French. Um, and that communist or not, they were seen as liberators by Vietnamese. In 1954, the French get pinned in at Dien Bien Phu and Nixon is launching this big campaign to convert Congress and media figures to this American hardline. Uh, and, you know, this is at the time that they're talking about Operation Vulture, potentially using nukes to save the French in Vietnam. Uh, JFK dissented and he publicly demanded to know how Dulles's plan of massive nuke retaliation, which is sort of the standard Dulles policy to stop communism, could, could be used to combat guerrilla warfare. A very fair question. Um, he goes on to give a speech in the Senate. Um, and uh, this is, uh, he, he talks about how, uh, this is from a secret briefing that Gullian had given him, by the way. So he's still consulting with Gullian during this time. And there's a picture of him in, a, with him in the White House in 61. So he stayed close to Edmund Gullian. Um, but in this speech that he gives in April, April of 1954, uh, he's drawing from secret briefings that Gullian had given him. And subsequently, this is kind of discovered that Gullian had been the guy that gave JFK this information. And so Gullian is actually kind of frozen out in the State Department after this and given different assignments, pulled off the Vietnam desk and taken out of the Geneva talks, which were actually about to get underway. Um, and but this in this speech, uh, Kennedy says the U.S. can't declare war on nationalism. He wrote uh, no American. No amount of American military assistance in Indochina can conquer an enemy which is everywhere and at the same time nowhere an enemy of the people, which has the sympathy and covert support of the people. The united action, that's what they were proposing uh, at the time, uh, is likely to end up as a unilateral action by our own country. Such intervention, Mr. President, would be virtually impossible in, in the type of military situation which prevails in Indochina. So as far back as 1954, he's saying that the U.S. going into Vietnam and attempting to single-handedly turn that around is doomed to failure. Um, and the next day, after JFK gave his speech, coincidentally or not, Eisenhower gave his famous domino theory speech. Uh, and and I, to be fair here, Kennedy does, in the years leading up to the, his, the presidential race, he takes a more custodial or harder line on Vietnam. He's saying more that like we are that we need to be dedicated to uh, helping this South Vietnamese state that gets established in the later years of Eisenhower's administration. So he's he's cagey on this. He's not completely this anti-Cold War, third world national supporter. He's like still anti-communist, even if his policies do differ from Dulles and Acheson. So what we're seeing in this historical moment in the 50s is the gradual collapse of the, the French empire. We know that eventually in 1954, the French are defeated at Dien Bien Phu. And then basically that means the end of French colonialism in Indochina. And at the same time, there's also a crisis in French colonialism in Algeria. So how did specifically, you know, the the role of Gullian and JFK and their their discussion, how did that also fit into French colonialism in Algeria in addition to Indo Indochina? Well, a lot of things were going on in the 19, mid 1950s, and we've uh, covered these, you know, reasonably well. I think in the in the recent Eisenhower episodes. So the summer of 1956, you have the Suez Crisis, and even though the U.S. didn't like Nasser's Pan Arabism and neutrality and recognition of the People's Republic of China and uh, his sort of general kind of socialist bent. Um, they needed to appear like they were the friends of decolonizing countries. And so Eisenhower brings U.S. power to bear on the Suez crisis and the France, U.K., Israel coalition had to retreat. Um, so that's that's one part of the backdrop here. In 
1956 in a speech for Adelaide Stevenson's campaign, uh, JFK was saying that cri these crises in the Middle East were not because of the communist subversion, but it was the revolution of nationalism, the revolt against colonialism. Okay, it's this fight for self-determination. Uh, Truman and Eisenhower had failed to understand this and that it's a major foreign policy campaign issue that has nothing to do with anti-communism. So that is a very you know, provocative statement in this context, okay? It doesn't seem provocative to us as, you know, dedicated, uh, educated leftists and so on, but for the American political spectrum in the 1950s, that was something. In 1957, Ike is largely silent on the issue of Algeria, which is the French situation is deteriorating there. This is after Suez, after the Indian food. Eisenhower is reluctant to really weigh in on this. Um, JFK gives a speech um, in, in uh, 1957 in July, and he, it's, he's talking about imperialism, okay? And he's, of course, so there's some qualifiers here, but in this speech, he's talking about imperialism as the enemy of freedom, and he says, the most powerful single force in the world today is neither communism nor capitalism, neither the H-bomb nor guided missiles. Uh, it is man's eternal desire to be free and independent. The great enemy of that tremendous force of freedom is called, for want of a more precise term, imperialism. And today that means Soviet imperialism and whether we like it or not, and though they are not to be equated, Western imperialism. Okay, so he's talking about Western imperialism, which is not, so. I mean, this seems to be weak and sort of qualified in different ways, but uh, for what U.S. politicians say, talking about Western imperialism, this is you wouldn't have heard this from Atchison or or Dulles. Um, this is a this is something a little bit different. Now he's not quite as overtly on the progressive internationalist side as somebody like Henry Wallace, but the political terrain has changed a lot since then. So the, the this. He in this speech, he's saying that the inaction of the United States in this, because Eisenhower wasn't responding, this was bringing the U.S. into disrepute. This recent history had shown third world nationalism was irresistible. DMB and Fu should have made it clear that French colonies will fall one by one, and these new countries uh, that are established are not going to trust the West because the West has impeded their independence for so long. Uh, the fallout of this speech was significant; that it was denounced in the press. Republicans and even a lot of the Democrats, especially Atchison, but even people like Adlai Stevenson thought he'd gone too far, right? Uh, that he was too too critical of U.S. policy and Western imperialism. And JFK was actually sad about this, but his dad, uh, Joseph Kennedy, said that he was lucky. Uh, he said that J J JFK's dad told him when JFK was all sad about the response to this speech, he said, within a few months, everyone is going to know how right you were on Algeria. Well, a week later, JFK reiterates that U.S. security would be improved if U.S. leadership and guidance were provided to aspiring third world nations. Again, this is kind of what Wallace was looking for, okay? But there's a version of this that's compatible with the Atchison Dulles version of it as well. And this is where JFK is sort of seeming to straddle both of these lines, and it's a balancing act. Um, but as a result of him, you know, at, things obviously go bad in France. Uh, in May of 1958, there's a French army revolt. There's a coup that's threatened and you eventually get the fall of the fourth Republic. Okay. And de Gaulle rises to power. JFK ends up looking very prescient and members of the foreign press and especially people who are like, you know, because Algeria is in Africa, uh, other African nationalist figures uh, start to really admire JFK. He becomes more popular than any U S statesman um, in the history of Africa which is probably still true to this day, probably more than Obama, you know, after all, Obama destroyed the most prosperous country in Africa. And there have to be a number of Africans that recognize that. JFK becomes very popular in Africa and he seems to have called Algeria correctly when the rest of the political establishment did not. You bring up this idea of compatibility with the, with the Dulles Atchison view. And I think it's important to point out because there is, a, especially if you're looking for the reasons that Kennedy would be assassinated, for example, you tend to pick out the things that uh, go against the consensus. And um, I, I think, especially given his awareness of something like the, the situation in what would become Vietnam uh, with the French, 
it's very representative of your you brought up obama at the end and i was i was thinking about how compatible talking about third world nationalism in that specific way is with sort of the arab spring era version of uh of u.s foreign policy and um also sort of reminiscent of obama even though i would still count him as to the left of obama unfortunately uh depressingly but um i i think if you look for a good example, I, I think of Thailand as being a good example of uh, it, it later in his administration in 1962, he sends in over 6,000 Marines into Thailand um, and they train counterinsurgency militias in Thailand and in Laos to essentially, li like you were saying, defend the drug trafficking operations and bases that they have to fund all of their operations around Asia. Um, but also as part of this sort of compatible containment theory version the alliance for progress that kennedy has is uh is is not at, at fully um in opposition to the way that u.s empires functioned under eisenhower but i i think what is truly striking about that and, and uh what stands out the most is the way that even just a little bit of deviation is is enough to be um anathema it's enough to be heretical to them um, because the, you know, they put out, and I, I think Bissell actually writes this, but the administration, you know, signs off on this overseas internal defense policy right in the middle of that, that Thailand situation where they write that the U S has an economic interest in assuring that the resources and markets of the less developed world remain available to us and to other free world countries. And that is sort of the, uh, we'll call it compatible liberalism in this case to the, uh, to the more like right wing hawk version of containment or rollback theory, which is to say that you pay lip service to some amount of uh, third world nationalism. And as we keep talking about, you recognize that the old uh, outdated form of colonial rule by European powers uh, is no longer in vogue and it's not going to be possible anymore, but that you have to transition to something else and still keep that access to those markets uh, if you want to uphold empire. So I, I just, I just kind of wanted to zoom out a little bit without sort of undermining this idea of that that JFK is running against the grain, uh, I think it's also important to keep in mind that what is truly striking is not how different he is, but how little it really, like the the narcissism of small differences for, for the deep state you know, network that it takes so little disagreement in order to be seen as, uh, as, as treasonous. So I, I just kind of wanted to lay out where we're going with some of this uh, foreign policy angle of his development of his thought, but We'll turn now to the domestic political angle because, uh, you know, as you said, he's sort of seen as a, as a cold warrior, but he's also seen as, a, and I hate to use the word, but a maverick. So why then, when he's running in 1960, does he end up getting help from CIA sources and most specifically Alan Dulles uh, in the course of the 1960 election against Richard Nixon? Right. And he, he was... As I've been uh, detailing, he was a bit of a maverick in terms of U.S. foreign policy, but that's we think of like Sarah Palin and John McCain now, and that doesn't. So what does that even even mean? But it, it was more meaningful back then, and these weren't huge differences. I mean, they weren't vast differences, but they were notable differences from the Atchison Dulles consensus before he takes office. And once he does get into office, he starts to pursue some things that actually are pretty drastically different, especially towards the end nothing bigger than the idea of like ending the cold war. I mean, that's that, that would have been a huge structural thing, but we'll get into some of these areas where it does go from being minor differences to like pretty drastic differences with the, the U S deep state such that it had to be resolved in the way that it was because they had, they had been defeated. And so the only recourse they had was assassination. And then they had to assassinate his brother too, as we'll get to, but in 1960, he's running, uh, as president, he's pretty young. Richard Nixon is the favored character, but Kennedy runs a good campaign and you can see pictures uh, from the debate uh, um, where on, on television, this is famously remembered, the, the televised debate where uh, Kennedy looked better. Uh, brought, Nixon had like five o'clock shadow and had, was, have, had a cold as well that he was recovering from, so he didn't feel that great. Uh, Kennedy looked young and healthy and tan. Nixon looked kind of beady and shifty, shifty eyed and so on. And Nixon wasn't like great looking guy to begin with. I mean, just just be real. 
Um, and so Nixon did not was not good on this new medium, and uh, it's a it's often noted often noted that people who heard it on the radio felt like Nixon had won the debate. Kennedy was perceived to have won by people who saw it on television. So this is the beginning of the age of television as a huge force in the United States. Um, he during the debate he basically runs to Richard Nixon's right in a couple of ways, and some of this has to do with things that Alan Dulles had told him about Cuba and so on and uh, per pertaining also to a missile gap because he had some top secret estimates on uh, what he called a missile gap. So he's very, uh, he's opportunistic here. He's not running as like a dove who is like, I'm just full on the peace candidate. You know, he did run as a cold warrior and as a guy who was like going to be young and take some action and so on. Uh, he's going to do something about this missile gap. He later finds out that there's, when he gets to the office, he finds out that there's a huge missile gap, but it's in the U.S.'s favor. And he's kind of, confused about this but what's he going to say it helped him to win and he's also got this cuba issue because he had he had sort of said like you aren't doing anything in cuba <laughs> okay to, to richard nixon even though nix and nixon couldn't talk about the plans for like this bay of pigs invasion so kennedy kind of is opportunistic about capitalizing on this but this comes back to bite him in the ass in a way but because he has less ground to uh you know question the uh the main tenets of that they're putting in front of him to justify uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion and explain its chances for success. Uh, a couple of anecdotes about this campaign, or just a couple of things here. He, he During the one part of the campaign, he goes to West Virginia. And of course, he's this very, very wealthy guy. And uh, he's going around talking to people in West Virginia and Appalachia. So poor Appalachian people and coal miners. Uh, there's an anecdote where he's talking to he, he comes in looking, you know, quite dapper on the campaign trail. And he sees all these like coal dusted faces of uh, coal miners. And one of them says, uh, he says, you look like you haven't worked. You know, it looked like you haven't worked a day in your life, Senator. And uh, John Kennedy says, well, compared to you, I, I probably haven't. And then the guy, the coal miner says, well, you aren't missing anything. OK, so Kennedy was good in these settings. And was uh, had a you know connection to people was a good campaigner and this was a time when you know democracy in America was such that it was not as quite as you know uh, over over determining in terms of like who's going to win and the money the the money's going to inevitably triumph although Kennedy was not lacking for money so that probably is a is a big help other thing I want to say about West Virginia and Kennedy is that my mom actually saw uh, Kennedy at the bicent or the centennial celebration of West Virginia because it's established as a state 1863 part of the Civil War well Kennedy appeared there in the state capitol and my mom was part of the high school band <laughs> so she actually saw Kennedy in 1963 the summer before he died probably around the time that he was giving that peace speech um but at any at any rate Kennedy is able to win a very close election uh they didn't contest the results it's been said that that uh Kennedy may have gotten some you know, shady help from the Democratic machine, the very mobbed up Democratic machine in Chicago. But I've read elsewhere that the reason that they didn't challenge Ohio was that their down the down ballot or the other downstate in Illinois was also corrupt in the other way. And so any sort of like uh, examination of this could be a wash. And so Nixon said, essentially, uh, you know, he, they stole the election fair and square and, that, and they gave up at that point. So Nixon's able to squeak into the White House. I mean, sorry, Kennedy's able to squeak into the White House and Nixon is very depressed. It did help that um, the political machine in Chicago, namely Mayor Daley, uh, backed Kennedy and had connections to his father, Joseph Kennedy, and whether or not that's from bootlegging or anything else. But anyone tied into that sort of organized crime world, there's, there's for the way that it turns out and the way that they eventually try to pin uh, the assassination on the mob it is hilarious how much uh they tended to actually help out and uh and stuff the ballot boxes on behalf of kennedy in, in a tight race here in in my hometown but um but yeah i mean that is very representative of the political machines of uh, especially you know the 60s and and the democratic party i mean chicago still today wasn't hastert getting money out of chicago and heroin cash and Rahm Emanuel and so on i mean it's a it's a mobbed up it's a mobbed up city yeah the movie the irishman that people probably saw a few years ago with de niro and al pacino one of those scorsese movies it it does kind of get into that of the 
the big uh, Democratic Party machine and organized crime. And um, but, you know, obviously, Nixon alleges this. It's not really true that that this election was stolen, but it is true that Alan Dulles did help JFK. So why is that? It's very strange because, of course, they would end up becoming enemies. Right. This is a good question. And uh, we talked I talked about this with Greg Polgrain in an interview. Why did he help him? And there's a couple of possible reasons. And I don't think it, Alan Dulles is a shrewd enough guy that I don't think it necessarily had to be one reason. Uh, you know, so here are the con, here are the competing reasons. And I think that some combination of them is likely the case. Is he hedging his bets, you know, wanting to make sure that whoever gets in, they're going to owe him. So Nixon, the relationship with Nixon goes back pretty far. But, um, you know, it. it, it he he wanted to make sure if Kennedy did win that he would have some he would be in his good graces. But also, Nixon could have been seen as having more independence. I mean, look at what eventually does happen to Nixon. He does pursue a kind of independent policy. It does break with some imperialist Cold War aspects of the of the U.S. Pursues detente with with the Soviet Union, arms control with the Soviet Union. Uh, wants to negotiate. Seems to want to negotiate an end of the Vietnam War, even though it's really protracted. Uh, opens up to China. So Nixon is. Perhaps because Nixon had to like build his own power base and was an upstart himself rather than somebody with coming from a great family. There was a fear that Nixon might have been more independent and less easy to control. Uh, potentially also uh, Nixon had dirt on the Dulleses. I mean, this is some, uh, citing the work of John Loftus. David Talbot lays out how Nixon Nixon's rise may a contributing factor to Nixon's rise from being a guy in the Navy and then, you know, uh, Whittier Law School out in California, right? And then he become gets recruited to run uh, against Jerry Voorhees in Congress and is backed by like Brown Brothers, Harriman, and really powerful Wall Street forces, that this may have had something to do with the fact that as a guy who was dealing with logistics in the Navy as an officer during World War II, he came across uh, material implicating the Dulles Circle, people like McKittrick and so on, Thomas McKittrick and the Bank for International Settlements, that they were involved in activities that would be have violated Trading with the Enemy Act and so on, and that this leverage may have been why Nixon was able to garner more support from these people and have them back his rise, these Eastern financial interests. But it also could have made Nixon a bit independent and not quite as easy to control. Perhaps that was part of the thinking as well. It's hard to say. I tend to think that it was more along the lines of hedging the bets and that Nick, uh, Kennedy's youth and his posture as like action man um, would be, would allow him for him to be uh, manipulated by these people when he comes into office because he's going to have no idea what he's getting into as as president. Uh, he's a younger guy, and uh, no, probably nobody's really ready for that job. So, how did these deep state actors then try to um, to undermine JFK from the start of his administration? Well, this uh, is fascinating to me, and. Uh, for a number of reasons, and uh, I'll, I'll try to lay out some of the main areas here where Kennedy had the deck stacked against him in, in some ways. I think perhaps most notably, the composition of his administration was drawn from a milieu that was really, really opposed to what Kennedy wanted to do, and especially what he wanted to do as his policies evolved. So for Kennedy, he wanted to uh, love it. The guy that was one of the people in the Bruce Lovett report, he's a guy that goes back to, uh, you know, establishment circles from earlier on. He's one of the earlier uh, intelligence guys in the U.S., you know, involved in OSS and CIA. And he's a, a family friend and a competent consigliere almost for uh, at times, maybe for the Kennedys. But he is, uh, Kennedy asks him if he would be interested in serving in uh, the administration and he declines, but he does offer a whole lot of um, recommendations. So this guy, Bruce Lovett, he was he was former undersecretary of state, defense secretary under Truman. Um, he gives Kennedy all these personnel suggestions. Kennedy has gotten far in life and his father was, you know, a guy who was part of the, became part of the establishment. Kennedy believed in in the establishment, um, and he didn't have any reason to doubt somebody like Lovett. 
Um, and but Lovett was also a trustee to the Rockefeller Foundation. So this is this Democratic character, trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation, you know, connected to Rockefeller or Standard Oil money and so on. The other side, the Dulles brothers, Sullivan and Cromwell, Standard Oil connections. I mean, this is this is the pinnacle of capitalism and it controls both parties. So Lovett turns down his offer, JFK's offer to take a position, but he recommends Dean Rusk. Rusk is the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. He wants Rusk to be Secretary of State. Um, Rusk uh, is also joined by another guy at the Rockefeller Foundation, Chester Bowles, as Under Secretary of State. For Secretary of Defense, it's Lovett who recommends Robert McNamara, who was president of Ford Motor Company and former systems analyst of strategic bombing during World War II. Probably seen that in the Fog of War, the Earl Morris movie. Uh, McNamara's deputy secretary would be another trusted Rockefeller aviation associate, uh, Roswell Gilpatrick. So for the, this, for the position of treasury secretary, Lovett suggests C. Douglas Dillon, who is a partner of the Rockefeller group in Congo, where there's lots of money to be made from mining and so on. Uh, this guy is scion of the Dillon Reed Investment Bank. Okay. It was Dylan Reed bankers like Ferdinand Eberstadt and James Forrestal who were behind one of the main uh, forces advocating for the creation of the CIA in the first place. Okay, Dylan is also a Rockefeller Foundation trustee. Uh, the dean of Harvard's, the Harvard dean of faculty, McGeorge Bundy, also a member of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund Special Studies Panel, um, became the National Security Advisor. And this actually changes the... Um, the way that the whole National Security Council is set up, it becomes more active. Uh, it, it basically, Kennedy reforms it along lines that were first proposed by Nelson Rockefeller in 1955. Okay, this leaves Kennedy relying on Bundy for all of his information on covert operations and so on. Although you find out later, he kind of, Kennedy does an end run around McGeorge Bundy to deal with the issue of Vietnam withdrawal. Um, Bundy, relies on CIA for this kind of information. His brother, Bill, works at the CIA. Bill Bundy eventually moves over to the Pentagon, uh, but this is, and helps Walt Rostow in counterinsurgency planning. Okay, Rostow, another guy connected to uh, the US establishment, a super establishment character. Um, you have another Rockefeller uh, official as the head of the NSA, the National S Security Agency. Um, that guy was a person named Fubini. He was a vice president of uh, Lawrence Rockefeller's Airborne Instruments Laboratory. Uh, that was the entity that had helped originate this missile gap thesis. Okay, so very tied into the military industrial complex and Rockefeller money. Um, these, another guy, Kenneth Holland, was uh, Nelson Rockefeller's like council, uh, information council in the Americas, basically, um, set up. It's called the CIAA, and uh, he, he there was a spinoff of that called the Inter American Educational Foundation. This guy ran this, so then he becomes uh, a conduit of this institute that gets all these CIA funds. Um, he's he's directing this. These are used to sponsor young Africans who were identified by the African American Institute uh, that was then headed by David Rockefeller's close associate Dana Creel as promising alternatives to the militant anti-colonialists symbolized by like Nasser or not, uh, especially Lumumba, let's say. Okay, so, and this was the program by the way, which as I recall was what brought um, Barack Obama's father to the United States. Okay, so this all- Says everything. <laughs> yeah, very connected here. So there's a good chart in the book and I'll include that in the, in the PDF that goes along with this here but it, it, you see how much rockefeller brothers just got into the kennedy administration so much so that in this this great book that i will be done by jared gerard colby and charlotte dennett they talk about how this was really nelson's secret victory like that's the name of a chapter as i recall and this was uh, a, a rockefeller establishment white house that kennedy was presiding over and you know he these he had no reason to like doubt these these people he came to learn a lot about this so you see all these people that do end up going there uh Gilpatrick Rostow Ed Lansdale Paul Nitza they were all part of the Rockefeller Rockefeller Brothers fund uh Dylan running the treasury uh Lovett is the guy who's the advisor for all this 
John McCloy, big Rockefeller man, super establishment guy, becomes a disarmaments advisor. Um, it really across the board, all of these guys, these establishment guys, Rusk, Bulls, um, Roger Hillsman, McGeorge Bundy, Walt Rostow, Lucius Clay, Henry Kissinger, you know, is a consultant at this point. So these are it's a it's a it's a Kennedy, it's a Kennedy presidency with a kind of a Rockefeller administration in, in many ways. So this is really something. Now, um, the people that Kennedy knew were like politicians and powerful, uh, like powerful people, but he didn't know all these people with experience in foreign policy. So that's where the, the stranglehold of like Rockefeller kind of international capitalist people over both parties was decisive, I think, for who was actually in the administration. And it really comes to work against Kennedy uh, as Kennedy wants to pursue other policies. Additionally, and this is worth uh, mentioning before we talk about the Bay of Pigs, Dillon was a guy who had advised Eisenhower. So his se Treasury Secretary, Dillon, the guy who would be handling his security later in Dallas uh, as Treasury Secretary because they control the Secret Service. Dillon was a person who had advised Eisenhower on Congo and had advocated the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. So you've got a guy in charge of your protection who has no qualms about assassinating leaders. We know what Kennedy's reaction was to the Lumumba assassination, but his treasury secretary and the guy who was in charge of Kennedy's security, totally for it, had backed it at the time, was probably popping champagne when it happened. Uh, this is Kennedy's administration. Now, the Bay of Pigs happens early in Kennedy's presidency. There's other early issues we'll talk about probably wait until the next episode. The last thing I'm going to talk about here is the Bay of Pigs today. And it's a fiasco. Um, under Eisenhower, the CIA began training Cuban expats to potentially retake the island, right? Because the it happens late in Eisenhower's administration, uh, and they're not happy about Castro, and so they want to retake the island. So, and Kennedy, during the presidential debates in 1960, had made statements about how they needed to do more on Cuba and so on. He takes office and he gets this, he inherits this plan. Richard Nixon had kind of been the action officer on it. And uh, it's presented to Kennedy, and uh, it's it's a fiasco. You have these guys; they were trained in places like Nicaragua under Somoza. Uh, they were trained, and I think they were trained a, a little bit in Guatemala too. But that actually may cause cause some problems in Guatemala. It's more in, I believe, Nicaragua that where they were trained. These expats, who were basically this, a lot of the goons from the uh, Batista regime, you know, these right wing, essentially fascists who left Cuba after the revolution. Uh, but Cuba, you know, they have anti-aircraft weapons. They have other weapons. Their island is, it's not easy to invade an island, especially if you're not going to go in with the full-on military. And it's a disaster. Uh, and it it turns out that, so Castro's able to repel this invasion. And it's a big humiliation. These guys are like frog marched on the beach that were captured there. And uh, the Cubans are really, the Cuban exiles are really bitter about this. But it later turns out that, um, they that they knew it would fail. I mean, they knew this. They knew that this operation would fail. Uh, John Newman dug up a lot of documents here, uh, and I'll include these as well. But they found out that there was like real planning that needed to be done to if they really wanted this to succeed, and they knew they couldn't do this. So, from a uh, eleven November third, nineteen sixty group meeting. Um, five days before the actual election, there's these documents talking about the plans, and uh, it's they, they provide a crucial snapshot of what the U.S. leadership really thought about what would happen in, in Cuba. They realized no popular uprising was possible, so they just lied to Kennedy about that. They said, "When you when these guys land, the people are going to rise up. They're going to be so excited to get rid of communism. It's just going to be so successful, so much winning." You know, like I don't know if they gave it to him that way, but that's how I imagine it, and. Uh, the covert the covert action plan wasn't really going to work. They had had people like the security advisor, Gordon Gray, one of the NS, National Security Council people, Gordon Gray, wanted to actually fake an attack on Guantanamo to give the U.S. an excuse to intervene overtly. They also said that real planning was called for to kill Fidel, Raul, and Shea if they were going to do this. And there's, uh, there's margin marginalia here that's actually really funny. They write uh, bang on the side and they, they write, you know, they, the, one of the main planners had been asked whether there had been any real planning to uh, 
have direct positive action against Fidel, Raul, and Che Guevara. And then in the margins, they write bang, in case you're wondering what direct positive action means. Oh it means God. we're just killing these guys. Uh, and this advisor said, without these three, the Cuban government would be leaderless and probably brainless, and uh, that it would probably be necessary to act against all three simultaneously. General Cabell pointed out that action of this kind is uncertain of results and highly dangerous in conception and execution because the instruments must be Cubans. He felt that particularly because of the necessity of simultaneous action, it would have to be concluded that this suggestion is beyond our capabilities. And then it's funny because in the margins they write, note, limit our, <laughs> note, limit is our capability, not morality, okay? Just in case there was any question about this, you think that there are a bunch of pansies who are afraid to kill people, you know, to murder people. That's not it. It's just we don't think we could do it. So they felt the need to like write a note about this. Uh, in reality, this was a covert operation. I mean, it's essentially like it was a covert operation aimed at the president. The idea is to get him to green light this thing. And they figured that once these guys ha are on the beach and they're getting like, you know, cut down, that Kennedy would rather than take an L that he would enter into, that he would commit the U.S. militarily for an overt military intervention. And it's, Kennedy it's shocked them because he didn't. I mean, this marginalia is really incredible. That that might as well be the slogan of U.S. foreign policy. The limit yeah. is not our morality; it's our capability. Right. We, we would like to, you know, overthrow more governments and orchestrate more coups and assassinate more foreign leaders. It's not an issue of morality; it's an issue of capability. Yeah, this is something to consider when you think about this. The, the Ukraine business as well, right? That's going on here, and like whether they can like escalate this or do more against China and more against Russia. It really is a question of capability because if they were able to somehow wipe out China and Russia by pushing a button without hurting the U.S. and leaving a world for them to rule, they'd probably do it because it's not really about morality; it's about capability. And that's that's the imperial mindset. That's the higher immorality. So Kennedy, as a result of this he decides he's going to have to deal with the CIA. Okay. They've caused this huge embarrassment, them having to pay ransom money to get these Cubans back. And Kennedy, to his credit, he says, uh, victory. It's said that victory has a thousand fathers and defeat is an orphan. Well, he says, I'm the responsible uh, officer of the government and I'm responsible for this failure. And his approval rating actually goes up. American people were happy about this. Maybe they were also happy that it didn't somehow get into a war. Maybe they basically understood the, the situation, that it was a fiasco, but that Kennedy didn't make it worse and he took responsibility for it, which had to be refreshing, perhaps to the public, hard to imagine these days. Um, but as a result of this, Kennedy wants to fire Alan Dulles, but he doesn't want to humiliate him. So he lets him stay on for a few months and then gives him a medal, which he pins to his chest in this ceremony and sends him off into the sunset, praising how, him for being a great guy. Behind the scenes, uh, Robert Kennedy is is given the assignment of getting rid of every other Dulles person that might be working in the government. So they they look through the rest of the federal government and they find that there's this woman named Dulles who's like a cousin somewhere else in the State Department. And they just fire her also uh, just to get rid of every Dulles in the in the federal government. And they um, start this committee to look into the, the this Bay of Pig study group with like Maxwell Taylor. Robert Kennedy and some other people to try to really hash out how this terrible debacle happened. And uh, so this was Kennedy trying to take on the CIA. Famously, after the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy says, I'm going to splinter the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. This is a, a quote of Kennedy's uh, that appeared in the New York Times in the 1960s. Probably comes from Arthur Schlesinger. Um, but this was printed in the New York Times as coming from an administration official. So there's really not much doubt about it. The veracity of the quote, you hear it all over the place. Uh, and he also called the Joint Chiefs of Staff sons of bitches. Uh, and he said also that business, my father told me that all businessmen were sons of bitches. And I never believed him until, until now. So Kennedy really spoke about the CIA, the Pentagon, and Wall Street in terms that no president has uh, since then. And uh, I think that that's instructive. So this is where Kennedy was early in his presidency, already really unhappy with this national security state. And for me, I mean, this episode is absolutely fundamental, not only to understand the assassination of John F. Kennedy, 
but also to understand Nixon, of course, Johnson before, to understand eventually Watergate. You know, this is a topic that will keep coming back up is, is Bay of Pigs. And, you know, that uh, we know that Richard Nixon himself was obsessed with trying to figure out what happened with Bay of Pigs, that he suspected that it was, you know, this operation aimed at, at destabilizing JFK and and it led to his infamous paranoia, which was obviously partially justified. So this episode is is just really crucial in understanding U.S. foreign policy and the history of the U.S. empire and deep state. It's not just the failed botched U.S. invasion of Cuba, which is it's often presented as. It's it's a much more important historical event that you know people like uh, Peter Dale Scott would call a deep event. It really is this kind of watershed moment that has a fundamental impact on history going forward up to today. Yeah, and I would also say that the young president like Kennedy, I had hopes, delusional hopes, that Obama would be like a Kennedy. And I, I personally think that they do these things in part to wrong foot Kennedy right away. They want him to commit to these some policies, not just with um, Cuba, but also with... Um, with Laos, they, they want him to commit troops to Laos. And he has to basically refuse to do that as well. They wanted ground troops put in Laos. They also seem to have uh, expedited the assassination of Lumumba under, with the understanding that Kennedy was going to reverse this policy. So they were actually undermining him between his election and when he takes office. And it reminds me of how under Obama, very early, you had this situation in Honduras that by the timing of it had to have been in the works before Obama came into office. And what does Obama do? Does he do what Kennedy does? Does he, uh, because the law was such that actually the U.S. shouldn't have backed, even if they didn't green light the coup and take an active role, you know, that they should have like cut off aid to Honduras and so on because it's a military coup. That's like actually what the law says. Instead, Obama allows Hillary to assert that it's not a coup. And then, so the U.S. essentially blesses the coup in Honduras very early on. And Obama has already in, in, in a very short period of time he's bailed out the banks and left homeowners you know screwed and uh, been a party to a banana republic style coup in latin america so there's your hope and change but it's a very interesting to contrast what kennedy did to what obama did because in some ways the way they got by the time they get to the white house they could almost look similar in terms of their rhetoric their slight deviations from the consensus but in terms of like actions um, you have what Kennedy did versus what Obama did. And uh, I think you can see um, just the, the, the difference there and how much the political system has changed, that the, there's just very little pushback from anybody who's ever going to get near the uh, commander-in-chief position in recent decades. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Bay of Pigs is a much more important event, historically speaking, than the Honduras coup. Not, not that that's insignificant. It's, it's an important event, but... Bay of Pigs just weighs over 20th century history in a way that few other events do. But in terms of the 2009 coup in Honduras, I myself produced a documentary, uh, uh, well, a short documentary, but a, an interview with the former president of Honduras, Manuel Zelaya, in 2019 on the 10th anniversary of the coup. And he said in the interview, he said that the coup was set in motion under Bush, the, the last year of the Bush administration, and he said that John Negroponte, who was the uh, the deputy secretary of state, making him like the second in command of the State Department in the Bush administration. And of course, Negroponte was involved in Iran-Contra. He was involved also in Iraq. He was ambassador to Iraq and was involved in working with a lot of like the death squads and paramilitary groups and using the same tactics that he had used in Central America and like the Contra war. And he was, of course, also director of national intelligence. So Negroponte is one of these kind of deep statesmen. And Manuel Zelaya, the elected Honduran president, said that Negroponte had threatened him and told him, you cannot have relations with Hugo Chavez. If you do, you're going to face consequences. And then he joined, Zelaya uh, joined the ALBA, the Bolivarian Alliance, which was led by Venezuela and Cuba, this economic alliance to try to get off the U.S. dollar. He joined Honduras to ALBA, and the coup happened soon after. I mean, that was the real... That was the real uh, decision that that made it clear that the coup was set in motion. 
So yeah, that's not that's not to excuse Obama, and it's certainly not to excuse the Hillary Clinton State Department. I think in many ways that was not only the work of the the Bush administration, but it was also the work of the Hillary Clinton State Department. And maybe Obama himself wasn't really privy to what was happening, but you know there are certainly historical parallels to think about, and it it goes to show that the U U.S. president in many ways is not necessarily the most powerful person in in the US government. Maybe it's not one individual, but the US president doesn't really have much control over the direction of foreign policy. No. I mean, it's it, it's pretty amazing that that Negroponte story is very similar to what happens to Aldo Moro. He was told by Henry Kissinger that if he proceeded with this compromise to like bring in a new coalition government that would include the communists that he would be killed, you know, that he would be that some marginal elements would come and kill him. His wife relayed this story after he was dead, but he was told that. So it's like they actually do send people and it's likely oral. I mean, there's a section on delivered orally. These are there's a section on this later on about the way that this works. But this is likely really what NATO is all about. Ultimately, that like the, there's a sovereign and it's not the heads of state in Europe or in Honduras. It's the it's the American deep state. And in, and in the US, there is some other kind of sovereign power that could can get rid of a president and and affect a cover up that lasts for decades. So this is where the who is the question of who is sovereign? What is the sovereign state in the United States? Who does decide on the exception? I mean, these are important issues that uh, which we try to get into here. And the Kennedy, there's probably no better uh, case to illuminate all this than the Kennedy assassination and presidency. Yeah, and you mentioned Aldo Moro. Just for people who don't know that that uh, threat came to fruition. He was kidnapped by this very strange group, the Red Brigades. There was like this ultra leftist terrorist group that was also anti-Soviet, but claimed to be Marxist Leninist and anti-revisionist and very shady history there. And of course, he was killed right at the moment when he was trying to not only bring in the Communist Party of Italy, but also try to uh, have rapprochement with the Soviet Union and try to ease the tensions of the first Cold War. So a lot of historical parallels, a lot of echoes from Bay of Pigs. But of course, there's a lot more we'll be discussing. We will be coming back to Bay of Pigs many times in the series. This is just part one. There's still a lot more to go with JFK, but we're going to put a, a pin in that and come back. This is the Empire and Deep State series. It is based on the book, American Exception, Empire and the Deep State by your truly, or not yours truly, by our friend here, Aaron Good. Uh, you know, historian, political scientist. And this is the first part of our JFK series. If you're listening to this, uh, if you well, if you want to get early access to all episodes that you're probably already listening to it over at patreon.com slash American exception. But if you're watching this, the episodes are published later, several weeks later over at YouTube. So if you want to get early access to the series, if you want to follow along in the book, you can go to patreon.com slash American exception. So thanks. Another great episode. I had a good time. Any, any final words? No, there's going to be more to say on JFK. So I'm going to keep my, my powder dry there, but uh, it was great to be with you guys again. Cool. Well, we'll see everyone next time.